I ask you to take your Bible if you'll turn with me to Gospel of Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Familiar story, familiar passage to many people. Gospel of Luke has more parables than any other book of the Bible. There is no doubt about that. The story we're about to read is often referred to as a parable. However, the Bible does not label it as a parable. So often it says, and he spake a parable unto them. It does not say that in this case. There are other indications that this may not be a parable. Along that line, there are those who believe that all of the parables are actually true stories, that as Jesus used these stories as illustrations, they were stories that were known to the people to whom he was speaking, things they had heard about, or perhaps even people they knew. And he used them as illustration. Now, that's not proven, but it's, it's a fairly strong theory. Luke chapter 16, I want to read verses 19 to 31. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Jesus speaking, he said, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us which would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto them, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, I encourage you to go back to verse 25. And I want you to follow with me verses 25 and 26. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, came to earth to be the Savior of mankind. True unity between God and man, true unity between man and man, can only be found through faith in Jesus Christ. At the same time, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, is also the great divider of mankind. I want to talk to you this morning on which side are you, the ultimate division. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for all the dear folks who are gathered here today. We do pray for the young people's meeting in the other building. We pray that all would go well there. Pray that you would speak through those who are working there, encourage them. We pray that you'd help us in this room in this hour. Give us fresh filling of your spirit and give us spirit-filled listening, hearts to receive your word as seed upon fertile ground. Always, Lord, we pray if there's a soul listening or one who will be later who doesn't know you as Savior, 
that this would be their day of decision and their hour of salvation. But for those who do know you, may we give due consideration to our situation in life. May we understand that there are divisions. While you have called us to unity, there are divisions. And help us to understand that we need to, un to determine on which side we are standing. Father, bless and move now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I talked about unity. I talked about division. We're going to talk about both of those things. Before we get into the text, please keep your Bible open to Luke 16. Before we get into the text, I want to give you a good bit of Scripture very rapidly because it is a good bit of Scripture to help you understand what we're going to talk about when we do get into the text. Talk about division. I want you to listen to the division because the division is rooted in the heart of mankind. The division is between those who will believe and those who will not believe. Mark 16, 15, 16, Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. The simple division is between the believers and the unbeliever. But it's such a distinct division. You know, when I was a teenager, they used to talk about the generation gap and the generation gap between the older generation and the younger generation. They told us not to, uh, they, they, they did, they told us not to trust anybody over 30. I haven't been able to trust myself for over 40 years now. But uh, they told us that. And then they talked about, are you in the now generation? Or, or are you in the Pepsi generation? And uh, they had all of this stuff about the generation gap. But the biggest gap is not a generation gap. The biggest gap is between the believer and the unbeliever. John teaches us about that division in the very first chapter of the gospel that he wrote. John speaks of Jesus when he tells us he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, those who did, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, not physically, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now that's John 1, 10 to 13. Jesus himself said, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned, but he that believeth not the Son is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 17, 18. The end of that chapter, John the Baptist explained the same idea when he said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. What is wrath? Wrath is hot anger. Again, the Apostle John wrote in his first general epistle, an open letter to all those who believe in the Lord Jesus and to those who may be trying to decide whether or not to believe. John wrote, if we believe the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he testified of his son. He that believeth on the son hath the witness in himself. And he that believeth not, God hath made him a liar because he hath not believed in the name, uh, in the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. There's the division. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know, have that blessed assurance that we often sing about. You may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now that's the division. The depth of this division between all those who will believe and those who will not 
is greater than many would understand. Jesus described it this way. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny also before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus said that. He did. Well, I thought he was the Prince of Peace. You thought correctly. Well, he just said that he came to bring division. And that's also correct. Well, that must be one of those famous contradictions in the Bible that I've heard about all my life. No, that's not a contradiction in the Bible. There's perfect harmony there. He is the Prince of Peace. And he will give everlasting peace to those who will trust him. But for those who reject him, they place themselves under the wrath of God. There is a great chasm, a division. But this is not the will of God. He would have us to live in unity. Where does this division come from then? It is the rebellion of the heart of man that brings about division. It is the idea that man says, we will not have this man, Jesus, to reign over us. It is a division that says, God will not tell me what to do and what not to do what I can and can't do, I will do what I want to do. Psalm 133, 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Notice that that unity is among brothers. Again, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So who are these brethren that are going to dwell together in unity? Jesus answers that question. Jesus said, answered and said unto him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward the disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Again, in Luke eight twenty one, Jesus speaking, and he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren, are these which hear the word of God and do it. Paul wrote of his deep desire for the people of the church at Corinth to be unified in their faith and to come together in their love and service for the Lord Jesus and have a heart that is one to carry out the Lord's will. Paul wrote, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that you all have the same message. That you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Peter wrote of the unity of families. We have division in families today. We have great division in homes, and it is destroying the very basis of society. Peter, writing to families, said, Finally, be ye all of one mind having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. That's 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Jesus commanded that his disciples should be unified in him. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So the ultimate division in this text in Luke 19, I'm sorry, Luke 16, beginning at verse 19, is the division between life and death, is the division between heaven and hell. Look again, if you will, at verse 19, Luke 16, verse 19. Jesus said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple. Purple was an extremely expensive cloth to have in those days. It was a tremendous process 
to produce the dye that would turn a cloth and give it the purple color. He was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously. Fared means he ate well every day. Sumptuously, he ate all he could eat. Clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. By contrast, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be filled with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. There's an obvious division between these two. First of all, there's an economic division. One is rich and the other is a beggar. I know, preacher, that's the, that's the curse of society and that's the problem. the problems of our society are centered on that. The, the rich people have everything and they oppress the poor people. You know, that's really not where it is. It's really not where it is. It's in the heart of mankind. Well, don't you think some people have too much money? I, I, I suppose I'm not sure about that. Well, how can you not be sure about that? Well, I don't know how much money is too much. I really don't. I've never had too much, so I, I don't know how much is too much. It's like sometimes people ask me, do you get enough sleep? I said, I don't know how much is enough. I, I don't know when you've had enough sleep. The fact of the matter is, what I'm trying to get across to you is this. It's a matter of heart. Now listen to me. If somebody has worked hard and invested well and done well in life, don't be angry at them for that. Don't be envious of them for that. Understand that they have worked hard and invested well and done well. And understand that God has given them the ability to do that. You read through your Bible and you're going to find a lot of the major characters in the Bible were very wealthy. We heard this morning in Sunday school about Solomon. King Solomon was probably the richest man on earth at the time he lived and may have been the richest man ever to live. His father, David, didn't come from a wealthy background as far as we know, but he became a wealthy man. But let's go back farther than that. Abraham was an extremely wealthy man. And it talks about his flocks and his herds and all that he had. Job apparently was a wealthy man. Well, that's all Old Testament. All right, let's come to the New Testament. Joseph of Arimathea, who helped Nicodemus take Jesus' body down from the cross, we're told that he was a rich man. Now, how did all these people get rich? Well, same people, all the way all people get rich, by being a crook. No, that's not accurate. Not accurate. None of them became rich by being a crook. They became wealthy by working hard and investing well. Working with wisdom. Well, are you saying that, that people who don't have a lot of money don't work hard? No, that's not true. I know a lot of work, hard working people who don't have a lot of money. Well, why do you think that is? There's not one answer to that question. There's many answers to that question. We could spend a lot of time on that, but I have other things I need to talk to you about. What I'm saying is, the Bible teaches us to be content with such things as you have. And if God's blessed you and he's given you much, then he expects a lot from you. Jesus said, unto whomsoever much is given, of him is much required. And if you don't have much, then he doesn't expect so much from you. The one thing that he wants from you, and, and listen to me, we just talked about the offering a little bit ago. The one thing he wants from you is not primarily your money. The primary thing he wants from you is your heart. The main thing he wants from you is your faith. And you put your faith and you trust in him. Now look at verse 20 again. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. He, he would have eaten the crumbs, the leftovers, what fell off the table, not even that which, which they would put back in the refrigerator if they had one, uh, but that which just would fall off the table. He would have eaten that. Well, that's what dogs eat, sure. I, I will tell you this. You get hungry enough, you'll take whatever food you can get. I grew up, and I'm not proud of this, but I grew up being a picky eater. Well, it's something set in front of me. If I didn't like the way it looked, I wouldn't eat it. 
It, it had to look right. Later, as a young adult, I went through a period of time. Thank God it wasn't a long period of time, but I went through a period of time where food was hard to come by. You know what? I learned to be glad for whatever I could get. And what I'm trying to help you see is this. This man was so hungry, he would have eaten the crumbs. But it says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, the fact that he had sores, and he doesn't go into detail on that, and Lord didn't. Obviously, it was not leprosy, or he wouldn't have been where he was. But whatever he had, he had some sort of disease or illness that caused him to have these sores. And the dogs came and licked his sores. Can you imagine? That couldn't be pleasant for anybody. Verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 14 says the wise man's eyes are in his head but the fool walketh in darkness and I myself perceived that one event happeneth to them all did you get that the wise man's eyes are in his head the fool walks in darkness but one event happeneth to them all the wise man and the fool what one event is that we're all going to die Every step you take since you learned to walk was a step closer to the grave. Boy, you're being morbid. I'm not trying to be. I'm just trying to help you understand reality. So it says it came to pass that the beggar died. It says the rich man also died and was buried. The beggar died, it says in verse 22, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, in the minds of too many people, that would be the end of the story. I like to read books. Somebody asked me uh, recently, says, other than when you're studying, uh, what books do you like to read? I like to read history and biographies. I do. I'm reading a couple of biographies now, and I like to read history and biographies. Uh, I like reading biographies about people you've heard about. Um, going through a biography right now of Winston Churchill, I learned a lot. Going through that biography, I knew about the man. Used to see him on television when I was a little boy when he was Prime Minister of England. No, he was Prime Minister in World War II. He was, but he was Prime Minister again later. And uh, I, I would see him on television. I heard people speak of him with respect, but I, I didn't know a great deal about his life. I've learned a good bit. Uh, haven't finished the book yet, but I'm learning. I'm reading a book and have been for a while. It takes me a while to, to finish a book. I've been reading for some time now a book about Ronald Reagan. I never knew him, but I uh, heard him speak in person on one occasion. Then I'm reading a biography written by my good friend John R. Himes about his grandfather, John R. Rice. And I did know him, but I've learned a lot from that book that I didn't know. And so these, I like to read biographies. But biography usually ends when the object of the biography dies. That's not true in this story. It says, the end of verse 2, the rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23 goes beyond that. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. We're told in verse 22, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and buried, but in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. Now that word hell in that verse, one commentator in describing that word wrote this, quote, in biblical Greek, it is associated with Orcus. What is Orcus? Orcus was a god of the uh, Etruria, a tribal civilization which ruled much of Italy prior to the Roman Empire. The Etruscan myth in Etruscan mythology, Orcus was the punisher of all liars and evildoers in eternity. So the word there, the Greek word there is Hades, here translated as hell. 
And that word refers to the infernal regions, a dark and dismal place in the very depths of the earth, the common receptacle of disembodied spirits. Usually Hades is just the abode of the wicked, a very uncomfortable place, end quote. Now that was a summation of the Etruscan and Roman and Greek understanding. But Jesus said something beyond that. In Mark chapter 9, verses 43 and 44, he said, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus said of the rich man in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. Now take note of the fact, and we'll come back to this, that he saw Abraham afar off, a long way. Look at verse 23 and 24. And in hell he lift up his eyes, and being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Now we could spend a lot of time on this verse. We're not going to, but we'll spend a little time on it. A few of the things we could talk about is when he says have mercy on me, he doesn't ask to, to be taken out of the place where he is. That's worth meditating on. He asked only for a drop of water. But he tells us that he's tormented. He cried and said, Father Abraham. Why does he call him Father Abraham? Well, this man is obviously of the house and lineage of Israel. He is a descendant of Abraham. He sees Abraham. Had he seen Abraham before? Certainly not. They live many millennia apart. But he recognizes Abraham in eternity. And he calls out to him. And he says, Father Abraham, uh, just a drop of water. Look at Abraham's answer. But Abraham said, Son, remember. Remember. I heard a great preacher talk about the plague of memory. The plague of memory. Memory can be a, an an awful tormentor in and of itself. We look back and we remember things that, that we have said or done that we wish we had never said or done. We can remember tragedies that we've gone through. We can remember horrible experiences. And they can affect us mentally and physically and spiritually. The medical term these days for that is post-traumatic stress disorder, and that is a real thing. It can certainly be something that stays with you. Usually we hear that term used referring to, to combat veterans, and many of them do deal with that, but it's not limited to them. Anybody who's gone through a traumatic and horrific experience can suffer the same thing. But the rich man cried out, and it was a cry that was heard. Abraham heard him. Look at 24 again. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Abraham answered him. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now, that was in that lifetime, now, your life on earth is past. It's over. Now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Then in verse 26, Abraham still speaking. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. Now we all here in South Florida know what a gulf is. We talk about the Gulf of Mexico, and I could describe it for you, but I'm sure most, if not all of you, are familiar with it. And it's a tremendous body of water, but it's surrounded on three sides by land. There's a great gulf fixed. I don't know if anybody's ever swam across the Gulf of Mexico or not. They may have. I, I wouldn't be totally surprised if they had. People have swum many other 
long distances. I read about more than one person who swam from Cuba to, to Key West, that's about 90 miles. Read about people who swam across the English Channel and other great bodies of water. So perhaps somebody has swam across the Gulf of Mexico. I've not heard of such thing, but I, I don't say it hasn't happened. But it would be a tremendous undertaking. I dare say most of us wouldn't get very far at it. But he says there's a great gulf fix, a vast separation between those two eternal spiritual regions. A great gulf fix between the saved and the lost. There is a view that these two domains were both in the heart of the earth. And there's some scriptural basis for that. Let me give you some of it. Psalm 66, 17, 18 appears to be a prophecy of the Lord leading those who, like Lazarus, were in Abraham's bosom and leading them out of that to the dwelling place of God. Listen, Psalm 66, 17, 18, the chariots of God are 20,000 and thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, the holy place, didn't say in Sinai, said as in Sinai, the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, the Lord God might that the Lord God might dwell among them. Now that prophecy in Psalm 66, 17, 18 seems to have its fulfillment in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended went up. What is it but that he also descended, went down first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Isaiah 5, uh, 5, Isaiah 5 14 tells us, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall not descend into it. The indication seems to be that at some point hell enlarged itself. Could that be that there were these two compartments? And when the resurrected Christ led those out of this place that's referred to in Luke here as the Abraham's bosom to the dwelling place of God, the place we would call heaven, that hell enlarged itself. Now, why would it need to be enlarged? Well, obviously, because it was going to have more inhabitants. That is the ultimate separation between the believer and the unbeliever. Between the unbeliever and God. Listen to Matthew 25, 46. Jesus said, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. What a division. Revelation 21, 4, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Revelation 21, 8. But contrast between the tabernacle of God being with men and God being with them. Revelation 21, 8. Four verses later, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their lake which burneth uh, with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All liars shall have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, so many people could say, well, I'm not, I'm not part of that list. I'm not one of the abominable. I'm not a whoremonger. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a sorcerer. I'm not an idolater. Well, I'm glad to hear it. If you're not any of those things, that's a wonderful testimony in and of itself. But those are all in the middle of the verse. The first thing on that list is the unbeliever. The unbeliever. Many people who are not whoremongers or murderers or sorcerers or idolaters are unbelievers. And then the last word on that list is all liars. Many people who are not whoremongers or murderers or sorcerers, or idolaters would be liars. But the key to it all is the unbeliever. 
Because all of these other things can be forgiven when the person turns to Christ and trusts him for forgiveness. I've often heard a radio personality say there are two sides to every story, but there's only one set of facts. I like that. I like that saying. Two sides to every story, but only one set of facts. We can have our different points of view, but truth and reality are truth and reality, regardless of our point of view. John Jay, one of President Abraham Lincoln's White House secretaries, found a fragment of paper that President Lincoln had been writing on, and he saved it. And on that piece of paper, President Lincoln wrote this, quote, the will of God prevails, period. In great contest, each part claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be and one must be wrong. And you think about that. Both may be and one must be wrong. Many years ago, I was at home one day and a knock came to the door and I opened the door and there was a couple of ladies standing there and they wanted to tell me about their belief and their viewpoint on the Bible and so forth. And I shared with them biblical truth. And the real point of difference was that they rejected the deity of Christ. They did not believe that Jesus Christ is God. They did not believe that he is the Savior. They did not believe that he is God. I shouldn't say they didn't believe he's the Savior. They call him the Savior, but they didn't believe that he is God come in the flesh. The Bible is very clear about that. Talk with this lady. I don't know. It seemed like I, I didn't time it. it felt like a long time, maybe 45 minutes. And she was trying to convince me and I was trying to show her the truth. And um, it is obvious after such a long conversation that neither one of us was convincing the other one. And I stopped and I called her by name. She had given me her name. And I said, you know, we can't both be right. She said, that's right. I said, that means one of us is wrong. She said, that's right. I said, dead wrong. And she stopped and she thought. And she said, I see what you mean. One of us is dead wrong. One of us is going to be separated from God for all eternity. Are you saying people can't have their own point of view? I, no, I'm not saying that. Listen again to the words of Abraham Lincoln. The will of God prevails in great contest. Each part claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be and one must be wrong. The rest of the quote, God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. End quote. Did you catch that? God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. Somebody's got to be wrong. Francis B. Carpenter reported that in private conversation, Lincoln said to him, quote, I know that the Lord is always on the side of right, but it is my constant anxiety and prayer that I and this nation should be on the Lord's side. End quote. You know what? People said, is, is God on our side? No, the question is not, is God on our side? The question is, are we on God's side? Exodus 32, 26, Moses asked the eternal question and gave an invitation. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Do you remember singing that a little while ago? Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. They did. Who are the sons of Levi? Well, they are, they are the ones who later, they weren't yet, not this time, but later they would become the priests. And they all came to Moses. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come. Jesus said of those who will believe in him, quote, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. End quote, John 10, 28. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, came to the earth to be the savior of mankind. True unity with God, and that's our biggest problem, is we're separated from God. There's a great gulf between us. 
true unity with God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And true unity with each other comes the same way through faith in Jesus Christ. We can be one in Christ. We can be on the same side in Christ. Otherwise, there's a great gulf between us, the great divide. At the same time, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, is the divider of mankind. So the question is simply this, on which side are you? On which side are you? Who is on the Lord's side? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we can come to you and call you our Heavenly Father because you have said, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. For those of us who have believed that we can know that we have eternal life because we have believed in the name of the Son of God. For those of us who have believed, thank you for being our Heavenly Father. Lord, there are those here on earth with whom we do not want to be separated. But they have not yet placed their faith in you. In my prayer for those dear souls that they would open their heart and they would trust you. In living each day of our life, we need to make our decisions. We need to make our choices based on whether they are in line with the Word of God and the will of God. God cannot be on two sides at the same time. Lord, help us to be guided by the wisdom of your Word and be directed into your will. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed this morning. I suppose most, if not everybody in this room, has already trusted the Lord as their Savior. Maybe somebody's wondering, yeah, I wonder why you brought a message like this to a crowd like this. Well, number one, I can't see the hearts of everybody here. Only God knows the heart. So it could be that somebody here is not on the Lord's side. I'm not saying you're a horrible person. We don't want you here. I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is you've not come to that point where you trusted the Lord as your Savior to forgive your sins, to give you eternal life. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He rose from the grave to prove that you can have eternal life and to guarantee it. And he asked you to do one thing, to believe in him. Turn from your sin, turn to the Savior, and believe in Him. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on Him and ask Him to save you. If indeed everybody in this room has already done that, I don't know that you have or haven't. You know. There may be people listening online who have not yet trusted the Savior, and they need to. They need to, in this hour before, it's eternally too late. I pray for them. I pray, Lord, that you would work by your Spirit in each heart, convict them of their need to be saved. And Father, I pray for those who are saved, that you would help us to be those who stand on the Lord's side. We've come to you. to be forgiven. We've come to you to be saved, and you've saved us. Now as we walk through our everyday life, help us to stand on your side. As we make decisions, choose to do right and not wrong. Choose to do that which glorifies you and not which our selfish desires would choose. Choose to do that which we know to be according to your will, not simply that which would be popular. Lord, help us to be on the Lord's side. Heads bowed, eyes are closed. In a minute, I'm going to say amen to the prayer. 
And then we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If God's spoken to your heart this morning, this is your opportunity to respond. Some years ago, we were here in this room and it was a Sunday morning service like this. We closed the service. The service was over and everybody had left. One lady sat in the back of the room all by herself. And I assumed that she had some need, so I came to her and I spoke to her and asked her why she was still in her seat. And she said, you said not to leave the building today until I knew I was saved. I want to know that I'm saved. If that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you not to leave the building till you know that you're saved. Now, Father, bless and move this invitation time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.